Thank you to Helix Sleep for sponsoring this video. I am someone who simply cannot function at all without a minimum of eight hours of sleep. Unfortunately, my brain loves to make that really difficult for me, and I often have quite a bit of trouble falling asleep, which is why I think having a good mattress is really important. Helix Sleep makes premium mattresses and bedding that are customized to fit your needs and conveniently shipped right to your door. Everybody's different, and Helix knows that, so they made the sleep quiz to match your unique body type and sleep preferences to make the perfect mattress for you. They have something for everyone's unique taste, and if you sleep with a partner, you can even take the sleep quiz together to find something that's a perfect compromise for both of you. I am personally a stomach sleeper, I prefer a medium firm mattress, and, uh, okay, exposing myself, I sleep alone. Based on my results, Helix matched me with their Helix Dusk mattress. I've had it for about a month now, and it's genuinely amazing. The mattress is so comfortable and balanced that I've slowly stopped waking up with the pain in my lower back. Compared to my previous mattress, which was about 13 years old, it's a dream. It's also really, really easy to purchase online. With your Helix Sleep mattress, you get a 100-night sleep trial, along with a 10-year warranty, and there are also financing options and flexible payment plans. If it makes you nervous to buy something that you haven't tried yet, you get more than three months to make sure that you love it. If you don't, they'll pick it up for you and you'll get a full refund. The best part is, if you live in the US, Helix delivers your mattress right to your door for free. It comes nice and rolled up in a box and is super easy to set up for yourself. I love my Helix and I think you would too. If you're looking for a new bed, I recommend you check it out. Click on the link below or go to helixsleep.com slash broey for up to $200 off your Helix Sleep mattress plus two free pillows. That's helixsleep.com slash broey for up to $200 off today. In the summer before I went off to university, my mom and I decided to go on a trip together, just the two of us. While it was fun for the most part, being alone together in a different country amplified a lot of the underlying tensions in our relationship. On the final night, we got into a blowout fight, screaming at each other in our hotel room. We had fights now and again in the past, but this one felt different. I said some hurtful things, and my mom told me that there would be no reason for us to speak to one another after I left for school. Words that sliced deeper than I could have expected. We made up a short while later, our tensions of course going unresolved. But it didn't matter, because our love for each other took precedence, and hopefully always will. She and my dad drove me the six hours to school, she helped me put up photographs on my dorm room wall, and we held each other crying at dinner, my dad looking perplexed from across the table. And when she left, I felt a great sense of loss. Ever since, our relationship, however volatile it may sometimes be, has remained strong. When I went to see Lady Bird in theaters back in 2017, I felt myself sobbing as the credits rolled. My friends and I clutched each other, all feeling the weight it brought down on our different relationships to our mothers. Lady Bird and I share many similarities. We both had aspirations of going away for university, we both like the performing arts, we're both lanky, and our families occupy a space in an ever-dwindling middle class. But in other ways, we differ. I grew up in a big city in Canada, much more bustling than Sacramento. While I do have a bit of an individuality complex, I am much less headstrong than Lady Bird. Unlike her, my parents made a serious effort to shelter me from their financial anxieties. My mother, a first-generation immigrant who has always been drawn to the fun affordances that Western life has to offer, pushed me to go away to school, to enjoy the opportunities that she herself was not granted. Tuitions in Canada are much lower than the States, so it was within reason for me to take out loans so that I could eventually pay back. But the ties I shared with Lady Bird allowed me to enjoy her, to feel overwhelming melancholy when the film came to an end, as Lady Bird stands on the street, feeling just as lost and alone as I did on my first day of school. She looks off into the space on screen where her mother used to be, their relationship not wholly repaired, and the image fades to black. This was the moment I began to cry. Lady Bird was a bit of a phenomenon when it came out. A directorial debut for indie darling Greta Gerwig, the film was lauded as a touchstone of feminist cinema. Critics heralded it as one of the best teen comedies of all time, a unique game changer for the coming of age genre. It also broke boundaries with the Best Picture nod from the Oscars, a title often exclusive to self-serious, prestigious art films and war movies. But of course, waves of popularity often have criticism in their wake. Soon many people, particularly in the online realm, chastised the film for being overrated. Some felt that it wasn't as revolutionary as critics made it out to be. Many pointed to the fact that the film, which takes place in a city as diverse as Sacramento, was overwhelmingly white. Many found Lady Bird to be privileged and selfish, especially when juxtaposed to her adopted brother Miguel. People derided it as a whitewashed version of Patricia Caruso's 2002 film Real Women Have Curves. Why was Lady Bird getting so much praise, such prestige and success, when similar coming-of-age films with BIPOC leads disappear into history? 
Gerwig's name slowly became a bit synonymous with white feminism in online circles, especially when her second feature, Little Women, came out two years later in 2019, an adaptation of Louisa May Alcott's beloved 1868 novel about four very different sisters growing up in Civil War era Massachusetts with their progressive mother, Gerwig used metatext to draw out feminist elements that were more implicit to Alcott's story. This included commenting on the different paths womanhood had to offer back in the 19th century by shedding a more empathetic light on the much maligned character of Amy, and changing the ending to feature Joe's editor asking her to shoehorn a love story into the end of the novel, something Alcott's editor asked her to do in real life. While the film again received a lot of praise, people were quick to notice Gerwig's tendency to write feminism with a very white gaze. If she could invoke more contemporary twists into the story, why could she not feature more black characters, or portray the complicit North in a less altruistic light? As Anita Call states for Varsity, Nonetheless, in her adaptation, Gerwig is blatantly aware of the intersectional challenges presented to her source material, and tries to involve fragments of critical race theory into a few lines of dialogue, but it appears more as a disingenuous display of virtue signaling than a sincere attempt to include and to educate. It's now a popular opinion amongst Gerwig dissenters that her cinematic oeuvre is a white one, one that we are only familiar with, that we are discussing so extensively, because her films are about thin white women. As Patricia White argues, Gerwig, whose authorial persona is informed by her signature film roles as an awkward, half-grown woman, attempts to wrest the iconic figure of white girlhood out of the mirror. Lady Bird arose from this legacy, this entitlement. Does showing someone who fights for her place, when she is already at the center of a culture's value system, crowd out other less charmed accounts of female self-realization? I espoused a similar argument in a video I made about Sofia Coppola a couple years ago, which is now the second most watched video on my channel. While I praised Coppola for her work, I also indicted her for her overly white, thin oeuvre. An oeuvre which, like Gerwig's, has come to represent femininity and girlhood in Hollywood. The same indictment is now being waged at popular author Sally Rooney at the moment, whose first novel, Conversations with Friends, has just been released as a TV series, the criticism being that she focuses solely on depressed, thin, emotionally unavailable white women. In the years since my video, I've become increasingly resistant to these types of criticisms. Having been a huge fan of Greta Gerwig ever since I saw Frances Hall 10 years ago, I find it easy to fall in love with her charming, yet bumbling, and often unlikable characters. I see a great deal of myself in them, in the same way I did with Marianne from Normal People, closely understanding her depression and complicated relationship with sex. It sometimes feels like a lot of my favorite popular works become the butt of a joke to people who operate in my ideological circles, which can be hurtful to experience. A lot of the derision towards these women, it often seems to me, results in a flattening of their art. Sometimes it seems that audiences today are solely concerned with representation, which is of course important, but not the only analytical lens with which to view art, that the merits of someone's work are often thrown out on this basis alone. But I recognize that this impulse comes from the fact that I, a middle-class, white-passing woman, don't have to work very hard to see myself in Gerwig's work. And just because we don't apply these criticisms evenly across the board doesn't mean that we should just ignore them. How can we find a balance? Nuance is a stranger to the internet, so I think it's important to explore the gray areas of this discussion as intricately as possible. If you're interested, please join me. Back in the 70s, feminist film scholarship was really concerned with the question of what women experience when they watch a movie. As you can probably guess, until then, the interests, whims, and pleasures of male spectators took precedent. Men could watch a movie and see every side of themselves. Cowboys, spies, adventurers, brooding intellectuals, spirited Casanovas. But what were women seeing? If you're a semi-regular watcher of this channel, I'm sure you're well acquainted by now with Laura Mulvey and her theory of the male gaze, the process through which male spectators derive pleasure from the woman's body on screen and female spectators are alienated from her. But you might be less familiar with Marianne Doan, who took the concept of the female spectator even further. In her essay, Film in the Masquerade, Theorizing the Female Spectator, Doan argues that the problem lies in language. A man can successfully define himself in the realm of language, where since a woman is taught the language of men, she can't separate her own femininity from this language. In Doan's eyes, it's better for a spectator to have a degree of distance from the characters they watch on screen. 
She adopts a very similar position to Freud, who believed that women were entangled within their own enigma and often risked becoming the object of their own desire. Of course, Freud was a famous misogynist and used this idea to argue that women were more likely to be narcissists than men, but what Doan takes from this is the notion that women are constantly needing to adopt male viewpoints and must therefore masculinize their gaze when watching a film. While she makes an interesting point, it would be apparent that Doan and other feminist film scholars at the time, like Mulvey, are making very generalized claims about female spectators. For decades, and long after even Doan and Mulvey were writing, women of color were not often depicted as ideal objects of desire for men. While their on-screen counterparts were by no means holistic representations of actual people, these women were most often reduced to unflattering stereotypes. The Mammy, the Jezebel, the Sapphire caricature, what have you. Activist and public intellectual Bell Hooks took note of this discrepancy in the teachings of feminist film theory, arguing that their particularly white viewpoints on the female spectator negate the desexualization and or complete erasure of black women from the screen. She says, Looking at films with an oppositional gaze, black women were able to critically assess the cinema's construction of white womanhood as object of the fellow-centric gaze and choose not to identify with either the victim or the perpetrator. This choice not to identify with the subject on screen in this way is what Hooks calls the oppositional gaze. I really think the splintering within feminist film criticism and within the female spectator herself illuminates something very telling about women's representation in film. It's something Simone de Beauvoir discussed over half a century ago when she introduced the second sex. All agree in recognizing the fact that females exist in the human species. Today, as always, they make up about one half of humanity. And yet we are told that femininity is in danger. We are exhorted to be women, remain women, become women. It would appear then that every female human being is not necessarily a woman to be so considered she must share in that mysterious and threatened reality known as femininity. Is this attribute something secreted by the ovaries? Or is it a platonic essence, a product of the philosophic imagination? Is a rustling petticoat enough to bring it down to earth? Although some women try zealously to incarnate this essence, it is hardly patentable. What Bevor is getting at here is that women is such a diverse classification, such a many-tentacled thing, that people who are women do not share any community, no distinct attributes or culture, only the arbitrary title which, in the case of cis women, is assigned to them at birth. Due to this, there is no universal experience of girlhood or womanhood. So when we see a film branded as belonging to a women's genre, its protagonist framed as the every woman, we get a little mad. This woman is not me, so why does she claim to be? But can we still enjoy those films? Can we ignore the fractured version of ourselves that's being sold to us? Can female spectators who do not fit into the narrow confines that the male-dominated film industry have drafted for them ever truly identify with this art? Or better yet, should they? Greta Gerwig has been an industry it girl for a couple decades now. She emerged as a fresh face during the mumblecore movement of the early 2000s, a period in which she frequently partnered with indie pioneer Joe Swanberg. But it wasn't really until the early 2010s that her career would see a breakthrough, when she began her long-term collaboration with Noah Baumbach. In 2012, she co-wrote and starred in his next film, Frances Ha, which tells the story of a struggling 27-year-old dancer living in New York and her delayed quest to independence and self-actualization. Frances Ha is hands down my favorite Gerwig film, mainly because Gerwig has a very lived in, idiosyncratic, and clumsy persona on screen that makes you just fall in love with her characters. Everything Frances does feels so natural to her being that you begin to suspect Gerwig is just playing herself. Eh. But what was most striking to me when I first watched it was that, despite her charm, Frances is not a universally liked person. While she almost always is well intentioned, her antics and goofy disposition often turn people away. Having grown up being described as annoying on more than one occasion, and often felt the need to rein myself in at times, this aspect of Frances resonated with me deeply, unfortunately. She isn't messy in a glamorous, self-effacing way. She's just messy. And for that, she makes me feel better about myself in my lower moments. I turn to her when I need to tell myself that it'll be okay. But of course, Frances Ha isn't Gerwig's alone. It wasn't until 2017 that we would get her full directorial feature, Lady Bird, and in my mind, she didn't disappoint. This is what I love about Lady Bird. I love its detail. Gerwig breathes such idiosyncrasy into every character. Every one of them feels lived in, like they've enjoyed a myriad of experiences that we aren't privy to, but can sense from them. I love its authenticity. The portrayal of high school feels realistic in the way she depicts social groups. While Jenna and her friends have an air of coolness to them, there's no distinct mean girls or jocks or nerds. The social hierarchy is subtle and overlapping. While Lady Bird is not cool per se, she can flow between groups with ease. 
I love how much it makes me laugh. The film is hilarious, but it never feels like it's trying to sell us a joke. The humor comes from characters and circumstances rather than punchlines. Same as moments of melancholy or sadness, they creep up on you unexpectedly, just as they do in life. Yeah, but also those East Coast liberal arts schools like Yale, but not Yale because I probably couldn't get in. <laughs> You definitely couldn't get in. What's most wonderful about this is that Gerwig taps into the beauty of both joy and sadness. I love its sentimentality. Lady Bird is nostalgic. Taking place at the turn of the millennium, Gerwig looks back at this point in her past with the same tenderness that I look back at my late high school years. For some reason, this period is more vivid to me than the past five years combined. She's capturing milestones from a very teenage perspective. Every emotion is heightened and even absurd at times, but that's exactly how it feels to be 17. The visuals are beautiful. Nothing is too stylized. Everything is understated, but it feels like it could belong in a scrapbook. Most of all, I love Lady Bird. For the same reason I loved Frances and Frances Ha, I love Lady Bird because Greta Gerwig allows her to be unlikable. She embodies many of the traits that I would rather ignore in myself. She can be annoying and pretentious, she can be bullheaded, rude, and insensitive. In one moment that really rubbed people the wrong way, Lady Bird accuses her brother Miguel of getting into university due to affirmative action. Many said that this was Gerwig condoning racism, but to me, this is a hallmark of great writing. Lady Bird is not immune to racism, just as most white people aren't. There are power dynamics within interracial adoption, and I think this moment is a highlight of that. Lady Bird is not in the right here at all. We are not supposed to side with her. Her brother is clearly a kind-hearted, smart person. We can see that in the way he treats his partner and his parents. What the moment reveals is an inherent flaw in Lady Bird's personality. She is self-absorbed, impulsive, and insecure. Her treatment towards Miguel in this moment is a reflection of that. It's an ugly moment. These instances are also juxtaposed with moments where Lady Bird is quite tender, or wise, or self-reflexive. If we expect our protagonist to represent all of the ideals of our society, to be morally pure, then are we really consuming art? We all have the potential to be unlikable and to go against our own purported values. Human beings are imperfect. Art highlights these imperfections. In one particularly obtuse article about Lady Bird for Quartz, David Kaufman admonishes the film for having to work much less hard to succeed than a majority POC film like, say, Moonlight. Yes, comparing teen comedy Lady Bird to haunting drama Moonlight, he suggests that Lady Bird is simply objectively less good. Folks might retort that Lady Bird does reference the class, gender, and sexuality dynamics of Moonlight, and indeed it does. But other than Laurie Metcalf's searing performance as Lady Bird's lovingly bitter mother, they're just too subtly realized to make much of an impact. Nothing about Lady Bird, not its script, nor its actors, or its director, feel like it's worked hard enough to deserve the near-universal approval it has garnered. Meanwhile, much like Black America itself, Moonlight had to work twice as hard for half the praise. Regardless of the fact that the two films competed in two different Oscar years, or that they are completely different genres, or that Moonlight won its Oscar run and Lady Bird lost to The Shape of Water, he argues that films like Lady Bird have an unfair advantage. Don't mistake me. I think Moonlight is an utter masterpiece. It's actually one of my favorite films of all time. It has the most breathtaking cinematography, score, and acting performances of the 21st century. But to compare it to Lady Bird is comparing apples and oranges. It's criticisms like this, I think, stomp on the merits of Gerwig's filmmaking. The criticism of Lady Bird, which I think holds the most weight, is that it's in many ways identical to Real Women Have Curves, a 2002 film starring America Ferreira. Real Women Have Curves is about a Mexican-American girl named Anna, who has just graduated from high school with stellar grades and harbors dreams of attending an Ivy League university. These dreams are at odds with the wishes of her strict mother, Carmen, who wants Anna to stay at home and work in a garment factory to help support the family. I won't argue, the two films are structurally very similar. Both are coming-of-age stories about teenage aspiration, mother-daughter relationships, college applications, and young romance. Both girls attend high schools outside of their financial bracket and go to university in New York, failing to reconcile with their mothers. But structural similarities aside, Lady Bird and Real Women are very different films with very different themes. Real Women is an exploration of the immigrant experience in America, and the contrasting ideologies between second-generation children and their first-generation parents. It's about Western beauty standards and the long, arduous journey towards self-love as a racialized person who doesn't fit them. The film is a commentary on women's labor, casting a critical eye on the exploitation of Mexican garment workers in the fashion industry, acknowledging the brute skill that it takes to work these jobs. 
Anna already possesses natural academic talents and has no problem being accepted to prestigious schools. Her only battle is with her mother, the double life America has forced upon her, and herself. Lady Bird is about lost dreams and teenage idealism. It's about understanding mediocrity and embracing a loss of innocence. It's about finding beauty in the things we used to reject. Anna also finds beauty and joy in the parts of her community that she used to look down upon, but ultimately she's right about the poor conditions they're working in. While Anna is headstrong, most of the change that happens in real women needs to come from her mother. On the other hand, it's mostly up to Lady Bird, who is often wrong about things, to soften and grow. At the end of the film, Anna and her mother never make up. A harsh reality for the harsh conditions she and her family find themselves in. Lady Bird, on the other hand, offers a glimmer of hope, leaving her mother a voice message in the final scene. If we're to read the structural elements of the two films and pair them with a the thematic, I think it's fair to say that Lady Bird may be derivative of real women, but perhaps a stretch to accuse it of total plagiarism, as many people did. As Monica Castillo writes, Troubled mother-daughter relationships are not an uncommon theme in female coming-of-age stories. In movies, defying parents has long been a way of asserting one's independence from them, no matter if it's in the headstrong girl's interest. She cites Imitation of Life, Mildred Pierce, The Joy Luck Club, and Dee Reese's 2011 film Pariah, a poignant exploration of a queer black teenager's journey towards self-discovery, as other notable examples of the mother-daughter relationship framing device in female coming-of-age stories. Differences aside, both Lady Bird and Real Women of Curves are wonderful coming-of-age movies, but only one of these films, the one with a majority white cast, would receive an Oscar nomination, and over $70 million more in international box office sales. Suffice it to say, Lady Bird does have systemic advantages where a film like Real Women would not. Why aren't we seeing movies like Real Women or Pariah receive the acclaim and praise that Lady Bird did? Castillo locates the source of the problem not in Lady Bird itself, but rather in much larger systemic barriers within the industry that are very much entangled with racism. Yet she maintains, I'm uncomfortable with the idea that fights with your parents or tough mother figures can belong to only one story. We erase the cultural, economic, and geographic complexities between these movies when we say that. Both of these movies should be enjoyed, especially since we don't have enough coming-of-age stories about girls. We should play as many of these movies as possible. We have a lot of on-screen growing up to watch. Brandon Taylor, author of Filthy Animals, makes a similar argument in an essay titled A Little Life Isn't Your Father. In this essay, Taylor takes issue with the way some queer audiences tend to tear down or spiritually murder popular works of queer fiction because they do not represent a holistic account of the queer experience. He uses the plethora of think pieces and essays against Hanya Yanagihara's A Little Life as an example of this, where queer critics reject the book on the basis that it harps too much upon queer trauma and pain without focusing enough on the joy in this experience. Taylor finds that these critiques tend to flatten the work of great authors like Yanagihara or Garth Greenwell or Ocean Vuong. He says that this impulse amongst audiences to reject these kinds of works, there's only so much laughing at catastrophe that a person can do before it's no longer irony, and instead it constitutes an emotional imbalance. Which again, could be funny, but also some things are just fucked up, and that's okay. He's right. Sometimes things don't get better. Sometimes pain never heals, and sometimes people are dealt bad hands in life. Where do their stories go? Do we ignore them for the sake of misrepresenting a group they belong to, or do we acknowledge the specificity of experience on this earth? Now, I am not trying to equate Brandon Taylor's community to the one I'm speaking about in this video. His essay is about internal issues within the LGBTQ community and about works of literature written by queer, mostly POC people. My video is predominantly about films made by white women and fighting amongst women as a whole, which, as we established earlier, is not a true community. What was relevant in Taylor's words was the notion that we do not need to take the most popular works depicting a certain community as gospel. Just because they are popular does not mean there aren't other alternatives. If we're looking for diversity of experience, it is out there. Real women have curves and pariah are less known, but they are out there. And no one is telling us we can't watch them. I feel like at the bottom of all these essays is this eatable impulse to murder a little life and all it represents, because that novel and novels like it represent some inaccessible realm of sentiment or set of aesthetic moves that lie outside of the interest or mode of the person doing the projecting. No one is making them or you or me or anyone write anything. You are free. But is it that simple? If the works we're seeing the most are the ones that feature mostly white, cis, straight girlies, is it not fair to ask more of them? If you have an advantage over others, should there not be an onus to go the extra mile? We talk about representation a lot, so surely it's important. To question representation is to question the role of art in our society. If we're to take Lady Bird as semi-autobiographical and assume that Gerwig did not grow up around many people of color, or maybe just went to a very white high school in a white part of Sacramento, 
We would be arguing that art is a mirror of our society. But is that the case? Scholar Sylvia Bovenshin thinks otherwise. Art exists so that one may recover the sensation of life. It exists to make one feel things, to make the stone stony. The purpose of art is to impart the sensation of things as they are perceived and not as they are known. Bovenshin is arguing here that art is created to convey a renewed or heightened sense of reality rather than mirror it. Her take is quite similar to the teachings of cultural studies master Stuart Hall, who divided the concept of representation of art into three readings, reflective, intentional, and constructionist. The first is a question of whether art reflects a meaning which is already out there in reality. The second is whether it expresses what the creator intended it to express. And the third is whether meaning is constructed through how that art is conveyed. Hall, like Bovenshin, favors a constructionist approach. The way that art represents our world will shape how a consumer reads it. Representation constructs meaning. So what meaning is a film with an almost entirely white cast told from a very white viewpoint sending to the viewer? What reality does it construct for us? Regardless of whether Lady Bird is told from Gerwig's specific adolescent experience, her film magnifies that viewpoint and due to its popularity, legitimizes it above other viewpoints. The abundance of white faces in cinema and the subsequent legitimization of the white experience raises the question of how much work people who aren't cis, het, and white are expected to put in when reading a work. Dominant groups aren't expected to put in work because they're the face of this industry, much like how I did not have to put in much work to see myself in Lady Bird. It's the reason films like Real Women and Pariah aren't breaking through. Studio execs don't need to cater to marginal audiences because they think the dominant audience is less interested in adjusting their perspective. So maybe a constructionist would say that the power lies with creators to construct a world that challenges our own. A constructionist like Hall, who sees great value in how diversity can enrich and challenge our current world, might say so. I emphasize diversity rather than fragmentation. Many elements, none of them wholly integrated, but not just shards, not just splinterings. The act of splintering doesn't suggest to me that anything emerges from it. Out of diversity, however, comes a new culture, new cultural forms. Out of cultural crossovers comes a new music, not emptiness. This was something that came up a lot in the criticism of The Little Women, which some people viewed as a failure on Gerwig's part to produce these new cultural forms. As Caitlin Flanagan states in The Atlantic, Little Women is the whitest movie I've seen since The Swiss Family Robinson. It has the same attitude towards the past that is at its core of the American girl business. History is not a nightmare to wake up from. It's a beautiful wonderland where there is always some girl whose life circumstances allow her to have a jolly and guilt-free time. Okay, if you're a lover of Gerwig, one knee-jerk reaction to these types of critiques is to argue that Little Women is a historical novel which takes place in the north of Massachusetts. It would not be realistic to feature BIPOC where they, and I say this with great irony, did not exist at the time. So it is unreasonable for us to expect Gerwig to change such an iconic story to fit contemporary societal values. But I would like to posit that that's not necessarily true or fair. Little Women could have incorporated more BIPOC actors and characters in a way that would not betray the core story. There were prominent black women living in Massachusetts at the time whose voices could have been amplified by Gerwig. If she could have changed the ending to be metatextual, she could have made other adjustments as well to make the film more inclusive. Writer Caitlin Greenidge draws attention to Ellen Garrison Jackson, who was close in age to Alcott at the time the book was written. Similar to Marmee, Jackson's mother was an abolitionist, and Jackson herself went on to fight against transportation segregation, setting an early precedent for later activists like Rosa Parks. Greenidge argues that Jackson is a figure who could have been believably incorporated into the Little Women universe. This is true. But is there a point to which, in asking Little Women to be more diverse in its perspective, we may be presuming too much that the story is claiming to represent something much larger than just the March sisters? In his discussion of race and cultural identity, Hall establishes that there are two different types of identities, one rooted in collective and one rooted in difference. These are both important facets of the same concept, but the way they conflict with each other reveal how difficult it is to characterize a marginalized group as a cohesive whole. On the one hand, identity is based upon the principle of identification, similarity and unification of a community. And on the other hand, it's based on difference and uniqueness, and having a fluctuating, discontinuous, and fluid nature. Cultural identities come from somewhere, have histories, but like everything which is historical, they undergo constant transformation. Far from being eternally fixed in some essential past, they are subject to the continuous play of history, culture, and power. Far from being grounded in a mere recovery of the past, which is waiting to be found, and which, when found, will secure our sense of ourselves into eternity, identities are the names we give to different ways we are positioned by and position ourselves within the narratives of the past. 
It's a little different here because we're talking about gender, but I think Little Women became a beacon of representation for all women as a collective identity. For example, one popular claim is that Little Women is presenting us four distinct archetypes of womanhood. The idealist, the realist, the altruist, and the pragmatist. In doing so, it asks women to identify with one of these characters, which could be a great stretch for many women of color who have very different experiences to the March sisters. But in expecting that from the film, we negate the other facet of identity, the one that's about difference and uniqueness. You could also contend that Little Women, while offering different variations of the female experience, is not actually claiming to be a microcosm of womanhood or trying to provide some sort of collective identity for women. It's interested instead in the difference of identity on a familiar level. How could four daughters raised in the same household become such different people? Little Women is predominantly a story about Joe's coming of age, the loss of childhood innocence, and the varying relationships between the March girls at a very specific and tumultuous point in history, one that informs the way they interact with the world around them. Greenwich herself accounts for this. There is a fine line between a piece of art that acknowledges it is about the worldview of a very specific person, in the case of Little Women, that of a white girl in Massachusetts raised in an abolitionist family during the Civil War, and a piece of art that declares that this worldview is the only one that matters and is fatally incurious about all others. I think we've gotten to the heart of the tension here. Where do we draw the line between the constructionist point of view that diversity can and should permeate art and the specificity of experience in storytelling? Now, as a longtime Winona Ryder fan, I'm biased towards the 90s adaptation of Little Women, but that doesn't mean I didn't love Gerwig's version. I think in her sophomore feature, I began to see a pattern in how Gerwig is able to read human beings. More so than ever, I saw the March family and their friends as real people rather than famous archetypes. I saw the humor in these lovely, nostalgic situations. Oh, Joe, you're here! You're one you like beauty! Boy. I saw the complexity in Amy, I saw the childishness in Lori, and the folly of his affection for Joe. These were all things that Gerwig brought to the story, things that are specific to her oeuvre. These characters breathe idiosyncrasy, much like Francis and Lady Bird did before them, in that particularly Gerwigian way. So the official question is, does all art need to adopt a constructionist framing and present an idealized world for the sake of a less fragmented spectator, or can some art be specific to lived experience and situated storytelling? I don't think there's a clear answer. Ultimately, Greta Gerwig could have made her films more diverse. In doing so, she maybe would have made it easier for marginalized people to read her art or to empathize with her characters. I personally think it's no doubt that Gerwig is a talented writer and that she should continue making movies. So what's the solution? I definitely don't think it's as easy as asking white writers to simply write more POC characters into their films, as many commenters pointed out on my Sofia Coppola video. For example, the 2019 film Waves garnered a significant amount of criticism for this very thing. Written and directed by Trey Edward Schultz, a white man, Waves centers on the trials and tribulations of a black family living in a Florida suburb and the events leading to when the son Tyler accidentally kills his ex-girlfriend. Whatever good intentions Schultz may have had, he does seem to rely on many popular tropes of black male protagonists. Star athletes, overbearing fathers, unexpected pregnancies, hypermasculinity. It's not a doubt that Waves is a beautifully shot film, but it would honestly read better as a music video than a feature film since the writing doesn't have enough weight to support the visuals. Schultz attempts naturalism in the very few instances of dialogue were given, but it ends up leaning heavily on tired platitudes. For example, I said it before, I'll say it again. The world don't give a shit about you or me. We are not afforded the luxury of being average. Gotta work 10 times as hard just to get anywhere. The result is a very surface level portrayal of Tyler's story. The character is merely echoes of black archetypes rather than fully fleshed out people. Ultimately, what's missing here is a distinct POV. What makes other coming-of-age films like Call Me By Your Name, or Rick Femi as Dope, or Eighth Grade, or Pariah, or yes, I'll even use Lady Bird here, stand out is that the point of view being written is so authentic to the creators, so idiosyncratic in experience, that it feels like they're bringing something informed where Waves did not. Regardless of whether these films are autobiographical, their writers are drawing from distinct events and perspectives in their own lives and the lives of their actors, whereas Schultz was drawing from a point of view that he can never really experience, resulting in a reliance on tired tropes about black people instead. Weaves is a really interesting example of a creator being entirely aesthetically motivated, but disingenuously committing himself to a socio-political reading as well. Schultz successfully conveys themes through music, narrative form, and cinematography, the aspect ratio changes during the film to invoke tone changes, but all of this is incongruous with a very superficial exploration of character and experience. 
If you want a more complicated example, we can look at Celine Sciamma's 2014 film Girlhood. Again, Sciamma, a white woman, wrote a film centering on a cast of young black girls in a Paris suburb. Girlhood is also aesthetically driven, but unlike Waves, the film received critical praise for its brazen portrayal of female adolescence on the fringes of French society. Many noted Sciamma's conscious avoidance of urban genre tropes and the honestness from which her character spoke. It's interesting too because unlike Gertwig, Sciamma herself explicitly promoted the universality of her film. When asked about whether she was aware that the film would invite criticism, she said, because there are very few representations, suddenly the movie has a new responsibility. That's a lot on my shoulders, but I knew that when I was going into it and I was okay with it. But I mean, I didn't know how messy it could get. I'm making this universal, and I decide that my character, who represents the youth for today, can be black. It becomes clear through the exchange that Siyama highlights the universality of her story as a means of pushing against the accusation that she was trying to make a stereotypical film. So in a way, she diverts from the specificity of experience that she cannot understand by arguing on behalf of the film's more general themes and emotions. She ends the interview by saying, I think that what happens in the periphery of what we see in Paris is what's happening in all societies. Basically, I'm trying to tell the story of a girl. The interviewer was right in her questioning, though. Whatever Girlhood's achievements, it still drew criticism for the inherent contradiction of a white filmmaker writing an experience other than her own. As one blogger writes, Girlhood cannot really be about or for the young black woman, but rather a pleasant voyeuristic platform for those beyond the black community to envision distant worlds within a safe space. Regardless of whether Siyama used and acknowledged her privilege as a white filmmaker, there would be an inherent imbalance and disconnect between her and the characters because she did not and could never live in their shoes. Of course, as I've said in many videos before, one possible solution is for white creators to collaborate more with marginalized voices, especially if they're going to be writing a film with majority marginalized characters. But does this apply if they're writing their own specific experience? Gerwig is set to direct the upcoming Barbie movie, and it appears that she's taken much of this criticism seriously, as she allegedly intends to use the film as a commentary on the exclusivity of the franchise and has cast multiple people of different backgrounds in a sort of Barbie multiverse. But this also differs from her first two features since the property isn't a specific story, and it gives leeway to adopt a more constructionist approach in her writing and present a more idealized message to her audience. I'm curious to see how she'll write these different perspectives, and I wonder whether the discourse around her filmmaking will take a more positive turn. Regardless of whether the Barbie movie is successful or more socio-political, I would argue that this doesn't make her other films any less good. Lady Bird is, in my mind, an aesthetically perfect film, and maybe it falls short in the socio-political realm, especially when juxtaposed to real women's clear political messaging, but when it comes down to it, it is socio-politically important just to a particular subset of people. The film itself never claims universality. It's press junk it does. I hate to be that person, but honestly, if we're to look at it frankly, this discourse doesn't arise nearly as often when a white man directs a film. Noah Baumbach is a perfect example of this. He's a close collaborator and romantic partner of Gerwig, yet I've almost never seen the same levels of criticisms waged against his overwhelmingly white oeuvre. We do have to ask why it always seems to be people like Gerwig getting this type of derision where men in Hollywood do not. The white, cis, heterosexual, often culturally Christian, male experience is the incumbent perspective in Hollywood, and only in recent years have we attempted to depose it. The dominance of this perspective has made it so that the white, het, male perspective is a blank canvas, and everything else is other. It's so dominant that even films made by white women are considered marginal. We're so used to seeing the scopic regime of male filmmaking that whenever films make it through the barrier, they're relegated by the press junket into being the X film, the woman film, the East Asian film, the queer film. So when Lady Bird and Little Women came out, directed by a female director in a sea of men, they were positioned as the films about girlhood, the feminist films, and so audiences adjusted their expectations accordingly. If these films are claiming to be the representatives about girlhood and women's issues, then they better deliver. And critics reducing these films to a singular identity, audiences did the same. And thus, we get one single lens with which to read them. How do they represent us? Marginal films, even ones by white women, are propped up as leaders of the revolution against the incumbent, regardless of whether they asked for the position. In turn, we expect them to be our leaders, to speak purely about our opposing ideology, to holistically capture the marginal experience. If they fail to do so, we conduct a spiritual execution, and a new leader, as ill-equipped as the last, gets the job. What we fail to understand is that, in propping up and tearing down these false leaders, the incumbent is still sitting at the top. Let's go back to Brandon Taylor for a moment. 
I can see being irritated that the books selling many, many, many copies are not your favorite weird Janae derivatives or whatever, and like, okay. But that is a frustration with commerce, not art, as my friend Garth Greenwell likes to tell me. Here's where I think his essay is most relevant. Our frustrations with Greta Gerwig might be a problem to take up with commerce, not art. I'm seeing a trend in audiences beginning to conflate commerce with the art they consume, and this has in turn created a bit of a crisis in media criticism and art consumption. We tend to take our frustrations out with the industry on individual works of art, scapegoating them for all that's wrong with commerce. At the end of the day though, they are good works. You'd be hard pressed to find anyone in those criticisms of Lady Word outright saying that the film is not good, just that it's not what they wanted it to be. My personal appreciation for Lady Bird comes from how much the film reveals itself to be a labor of love. You can tell Gerwig adores her characters and wrote them with empathy and gentleness. There are people pouring their souls into art. Now I want to be clear that I obviously don't think it's wrong to want to see a holistic representation of oneself on screen. As I discussed earlier, spectator identification is important and diversity in art is nourishing. But where I sometimes take issue is in the way we discuss it. In reducing Gerwig's films down to one mode of analysis, I flatten the experience of consuming her art. But if I were to criticize the representational shortcomings of her films, while also acknowledging that I may be placing a disproportionate focus on them because the system in which they operate is flawed, I leave more room to enjoy them from other angles. I use them as a stepping stone to consuming different, richly rendered alternatives. It is a terrible reality that studios do not value or trust marginalized people to be able to pull in numbers. They've been proven wrong before. Black Panther is a great example of how much taking a chance on these forms of representation will pay off. The film was directed by a black director with an almost entirely black cast, set in Africa, and it was one of the highest grossing films that year and one of the most renowned of the Marvel franchise. Hopefully that odd person who decides to take a risk against their archaic system will continue to prove studios wrong. But in the meantime, and I say this with the most lukewarm conviction possible, Lady Bird might not be your mother? I've mentioned Greta Gerwig, Sofia Coppola, and Sally Rooney, and now I'm going to top the essay off with the sad white girl of all sad white girls, Miss Joan Didion. She has a quote for everything, and now is no exception. Didion famously once said this, We tell ourselves stories in order to live. What she means here is that human beings cope with the nothingness of life by constructing narratives out of it. In doing so, we reach into the void and find catharsis. Stories help us discover meaning in futility. And I, I also, I'm a big believer and I think structure is so deep in us. Like I think it's so What's well, your inherent. friend, right? Yeah. It, you can use it. And it's so, we put it even in stories we tell our friends or in emails we write, we have a, we want it. It's how we create meaning. So I feel like sometimes kind of coming at it from an analytical way, it's like denying your birthright, which is story structure. Your birthright is story structure, you have it. Like, you don't need to teach yourself how to do it. You have it by the fact that you exist with language. What is film but not a storytelling device? We watch film to make sense of the world around us and to view it with a new pair of eyes. I bristled with Chiron and Moonlight. I felt the glee of Henry Hill and Goodfellas. I wondered with Amelie, yearned with Sue, laughed with Hedwig, and cried with George. A good movie has the capacity to move just about anyone, just as all good art does. Maybe the objective should be less about tearing down individual works of art, and more about asking for more stories. More and more and more and more so we can discover specificity in the universal and universality in the specific. There is no true woman community, so there is no universal girl. The universal girl is a child of the market. So I made this video because I don't think the universal girl exists in Greta Gerwig's films. The strength in her filmmaking lies in the idiosyncrasy of her characters. They live and breathe as real people, not as archetypes. Their popularity only shows us that we need more coming of age stories about girls. Like Caitlin Greenidge says, discussions of erasure should be an invitation to creation, not an end to conversation. <laughs>